We've all heard that old saying that those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. Well, nobody wants to repeat anything like the Great Depression. But there is a precious lesson those desperate days in our history has taught us. It was a time when Americans forgot their differences and came together. Like my own family and the Kesslers. My father had lost his job as a ditch digger when construction work virtually stopped after the crash. The Kesslers owned a struggling grocery store and needed someone to run it. They took my parents in and allowed our family of five to live in one large room behind the store. Without the Kesslers, the Cuomos might not have made it. But together, both we and the Kesslers endured. I was born behind Kessler's grocery store in 1932, the year that another former New York governor ran for president and began to change America forever. If you lived on Easy Street, it was the bitterest of dead ends. Those who had been the most suddenly became the least. But if you had calluses on your hands and a tenacious dream, it could be a new beginning. Now all of a sudden we had no money. Nobody else had any money either. Everybody was just singing out the same hymn book. Men and women came into contact with their best possible selves. That it was possible for people, if they got together, if they did things together, uh, to defy the forces of authority and do something that's right. The mighty were falling. The dispossessed were getting a second chance to win their birthright. And a great adventure was to be had on the dusty roads and clattering boxcars of the land. I covered myself in glory in the hobo camps. Spend an hour by yourself on a riverbank and listen to it and, and see if you don't hear it say something to your soul. It was the fall and rise of a nation, the Great Depression. We knew there could be good times but we were most impressed by the fact that there could be bad times. It could happen again. And if you know what happened then, you'll be better prepared for what might happen tomorrow. Everyone you meet, all they talk about is this depression. They blame it on the war, they blame it on Wall Street, on politics and this administration. For two years now we've been assured good times are on the way. I wonder how much longer we must hear them talk this way. Prosperity is just around the corner. What we'd like to know is which corner. We've turned so many corners now we're dizzy. But still I'm positive we'll soon be busy. Why, I read in Monday's paper where 10,000 men were hired. Yes, but Tuesday they forgot to say 12,000 more were fired. But I insist this land of ours is stable. Stable? Sounds like horses to me. It was the Depression and election year of 1932. In just three years, America had been rocked off its foundations. The stability and prosperity of the 20s were gone, replaced by fear and hunger. And you couldn't even get a legal glass of beer to take the edge off a world gone crazy. You might not have enough to eat, 
Yet you saw farmers on the newsreels dumping milk because they couldn't afford to bring it to market. It was the rainy day you'd been saving your money for. But your money was suddenly all gone because the bank had closed its doors. In the words of a popular depression song, you can't go to the poor house because the beds have all filled up with millionaires. And because the poor house was the White House now. The man in the White House wasn't hungry, but he was as fearful as any American of losing his job. Herbert Hoover was being personally blamed for the Great Depression. I was playing with a little girl on the Maypole rings and suddenly her mother came and snatched her away and said, you can't play with her. She's responsible for your father losing his job. He was an unlikely villain. The name Hoover had been synonymous with humanitarian. He had made his reputation during the Great War. For the starving nation of Belgium, caught between German trenches and a British blockade, Hoover orchestrated shipments of food. Hoover kitchens, the relief stations were called. But he had no craving for fame and power. Hoover always claimed he was a public servant, not a politician. I told him one time, you know less about politics than any man that ever sat in the White House. And he didn't dispute it. This rare home movie footage shows the real Hoover. A man who preferred fishing with his granddaughters to the trappings of wealth and power. Nevertheless, his humanitarian fame and progressive politics put him in demand. In 1928, he was the overwhelming choice to succeed Calvin Coolidge in the White House. Hoover assumed the office, but not the $75,000 a year salary. He never took one dime, one red cent as president. He turned it all back in the treasury because he had money. It was the height of the economic boom. Hoover appeared ready to preside over an unrivaled time of prosperity in America. And yet he had personal misgivings about uncontrolled speculation on Wall Street. He liquidated most of his own stocks at the peak of the bull market. Hoover was one of the few to get out in time. There were other signs of distress in the land. Farming had been in a slump since the end of the Great War. In the cities, assembly lines were humming at substantial human cost. It was the age of the infamous speed up. Even the elite noticed a kind of spiritual bankruptcy in America. In his essay, The Jazz Age, F. Scott Fitzgerald told of the epidemic of suicide among his friends. The good life, it seemed, was not good enough to live for. Then came Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. Black Tuesday. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. My mother gambled on the stock market, so she always asked me to call up Saint-Fal, which was the broker, and ask them for the quotation, the stock market quotations. So I call again that one afternoon, and I didn't remember from one day to the next what the quotations were, and I quoted the figures to her, and she faded dead away on the bed. When I arrived in New York after the crash, I found a city of very bewildered people. They were bewildered, they were frightened, and they were in shock. Some people thought the crash was an opportunity. Suddenly stocks were cheap. Now is the time to buy. 
I hope you have plenty of the wherewithal to wade in and buy. But not long after Black Tuesday, many stocks were about as valuable as wallpaper. I remember looking with considerable interest at one room in a Chicago club where members took stocks that went to nothing and pasted them on the wall as a souvenir of the Depression. The demand for goods vanished. Assembly lines ground to a halt. And crops rotted in the field because they weren't worth the price of picking. In response to the emergency, President Hoover cut income taxes. It was little help when the tax on an average salary of $4,000 was less than $6 per year. But otherwise, he believed government should leave the economy alone. It would heal itself. Prosperity, he predicted, was just around the corner. That kind of advice had seen Americans through recessions for more than a hundred years. But this time, they weren't buying it. Americans turned on the president with a vengeance. The town that I lived in was a Republican town. And even there you found a breakthrough of people getting disenchanted with President Hoover. It is one of the ironies, one of the tragedies, in fact, of Hoover's career, that this instinctively progressive man, who had a sense of government uh, as an intervening authority, although a limited, more limited sense than his successor, it's a, it's a real irony that he would be, Hoover would be perceived as a conservative reactionary president. Having identified a scapegoat, the country now set about adopting a hero. He would be everything that Herbert Hoover was not. A Democrat, an aristocrat, a consummate politician. A role that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born to play. He had it. He had charm. Charisma. He just caught on. I don't mean caught on like a movie star or a rock star today. No, 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 no. We don't experience any more politicians who catch on. Well, FDR caught on. Something else was catching on in the early 1930s. A bizarre fad that in many ways mirrored this most unusual time in America. Marathon dancing. By 1932, one in four Americans was out of work. Desperate for a way to pass the time, people embraced a desperate form of entertainment, one that could last as long as nine months. Marathon dancing had been around since the early 20s. Back then, it was part of the craze to establish endurance records. Gertrude Utterly swam the English Channel. There were tree sitters, people who sat in trees. There were flagpole sitters. Some man pushed a peanut up Pike's Peak with his nose. I mean, people were trying to express, you know, what is the limit of, of the human body as a machine. At first, dancers moved non-stop to recorded music for more than 24 hours at a time. But promoters soon found a way of extending the contests indefinitely by changing the rules. By the Depression, those rules were generally 45 minutes of dancing and 15 minutes of rest, 24 hours a day, round the clock. And they feed you seven times a day on a table that rolls out on the floor. So you can eat seven times. I thought, gee, they feed you. That was pretty good. During the Depression, marathon dancing took on a whole new character. It became hugely popular. People looking for cheap entertainment found it at the dance halls. 25 cents to get in, a dollar a night, and you could stay for hours. It became far more than an endurance contest. Marathon dances evolved into live soap operas, heated dramas of romance, survival, and danger, and full of gimmicks to keep the customers coming back. 
At one marathon, a man hung upside down for several days. There was something called Frozen Alive, in which a contestant would volunteer to be entombed in a huge block of ice. And this was all dramatized. The promoter would go up to the ice and hold the microphone against it and say, you know, are you frozen yet? Can you still breathe? And of course, the contestant would have a flashlight and, and signal with the light. The most popular promotion was a wedding staged on the dance floor. The lucky couples were thrown lavish ceremonies complete with, in this case, cellophane gowns. Some of these weddings were legitimate, but by no means all. Sometimes they were married by real ministers and had to get a divorce, and sometimes they weren't. Polite society was scandalized by dance marathons, suspecting that the prizes were rigged, as they often were, and that more than resting was going on during the breaks as it often was. One contestant, Stan West, told me that he loved to seduce women in the audience and that he would try to get them to go outside with him for 15 minutes during his rest break instead of going to the, to the boys' quarters. Fortunately or unfortunately, it was a very quick event. Unfazed, the fans kept on coming back to the dance halls. They became a haven for out-of-work entertainers. Red Skelton was an MC for a time when vaudeville dried up. Jazz diva Anita O'Day performed for the first time at a marathon. And I just said, I know a tune called The Lady in Red. Do you think I could sing it some night, you know? And they let me sing The Lady in Red. And the people in the audience throw money on the floor. Everybody helps pick it up to put it in your pocket, take it in the back room, put it in your suitcase, and you're beginning to save your money. You're beginning to learn to sing with the band. Then there were those who danced out of hunger. Food was plentiful, six or seven meals a day, and contestants got a place to sleep, if only for 15 minutes at a time. Popular couples would find local sponsors. Audience members would throw coins at their favorite dancers. This was called a silver shower. Well, it's money. You put it in the pocket, you put it in the drawer in the back, and by the time you leave, you got a hundred bucks in change. <laughs> and of course, there was the prize money, a thousand dollars or more that awaited the last couple on their feet. The lure of the prizes and sometimes the fear of a return to homelessness kept the dances going on for months at a time. The longest, in Chicago, lasted from August 1930 to April 1931, more than nine months. Deep into a marathon, it became surreal. Dancers actually asleep on their feet and suffering hallucinations. Going squarely, it was called. Like the weddings, it was often feigned. Contestants very soon learned that spectators liked the idea of kind of temporary madness. So at one show, a man was picking daisies as if he was in a field. I think the line between what was performed and what was in fact really going on was often very blurry. In the fall of 1932, an intricate dance of a different kind was winding down, and it was plain to see who would drop by the wayside. Our party can truly feel that we have held the faith. Herbert Hoover had stood by his guns throughout the crisis. It was old-time individualism, not the government, that would see the nation clear. Deficit spending was unthinkable, as was welfare, even if the people were hungry. Hoover didn't sugarcoat this bitter medicine. He didn't seem to mind if he was unpopular, as long as he was correct. He became an easy target for a master politician. It is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But these toes belong to the comparative few. FDR had a very particular approach to politics, quite unique. Very different from today's politicians and very different from most politicians before him. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the game. He saw it as a game, played it as a game. You have nominated me. Unlike Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt did not write his own speeches. 
but the power of the voice behind the borrowed words was electrifying. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. He may have been speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, but the young people thought that he was talking directly to them. I make it almost sound mystical, and it almost was. I remember going once to a soldier's field in Chicago where there were thousands and thousands of people there. And when he made his talk, he was talking to me. For all the infatuation with FDR, there were those who hated him passionately, especially members of his own social class. FDR was considered a traitor to his class and spoken of in that way. He's a traitor to us and we are better than those other people is basically what they're saying. While FDR provoked strong emotions in voters, President Hoover seemed cold and distant. For the first time, these surface impressions were carried to a mass audience via radio and newsreels. The result, in November, was a landslide victory for FDR and the Democrats. During the four months between the election and the inauguration, the depression worsened, and the political differences between FDR and Hoover turned into bitter personal hostility. Hoover tried to draw Roosevelt into a cooperative effort to relieve the emergency, but the president-elect refused. He was saving his ammunition. Hoover ignored the convention of dining with the Roosevelts at the White House. He invited them to an afternoon tea instead. Feeling snubbed, FDR declined the invitation. By the time he exited the White House for the last time as president, Hoover was barely on speaking terms with Roosevelt. So when they rode from the White House to the Capitol, you get these photographs and this marvelous cartoon showing the smiling FDR, confident um, Hoover just as glum. I mean, you couldn't tell the difference between where his crumpled top hat was and his face began. An atmosphere of petty rancor on a bleak day in Washington that was punctuated by ringing words from the Capitol steps. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. This was probably one of the great statements and misstatements of all time. If he wanted to put it more accurately, he would have added, but there is a lot to fear. Nonetheless, the mood of the country was energized, gone were the dismal days of government inertia. But it would be some time before the change at the top would make any difference to the man in the street. He wasn't looking toward the White House for relief from the Depression. He was probably headed west on a boxcar. Hard times had become the golden age of the American hobo. Westbound, the way of all great human migration. We're reminded of Henry David Thoreau, one of his essays, Westering. He says that there's a kind of inevitable westward movement in American life, that America is looking west. We think back to Thomas Jefferson and notes on the present state of Virginia looking out to the continent, sending Lewis and Clark across the continent. I think there's a sense of destiny to that uh, western movement, and the Depression uh, accelerated, picked up on that, and made it really into one of the epics of migration in American history. If you had some kind of a car and a few dollars for gas and repairs, this was the way west, Route 66. But if you really had nothing, you only had one choice, the abundant and free, though illegal, method of freight hopping. In the parlance of the time, you became a gentleman of the road. And a lot of ladies can remember that. The older ladies will remember that. Gentlemen of the road. I wish there was more of them today. <laughs> hobos had been around since the Civil War. Back then they were called ho-boys, men who carried a hoe or shovel from town to town in search of farm work. 
The hobo population was a kind of economic indicator. Few in times of prosperity, they would increase during a crisis. During the Great Depression, it's believed that as many as a million and a half hobos were riding the rails. Among them, men who showed signs of having fallen from high stations. They had floor shine shoes that was wearing out, and they had shiny pants that was wearing out, and they had nice white shirts, and they had nice jackets and vests, and a lot of more on one road. And they were funny looking, and the other hobos would laugh at them. These human scarecrows provided inspiration for a clown. Emmett Kelly became famous for his battered derby and shredded finery. Hobos became staples of Depression-era newsreels. Shots of crowded boxcars said a lot about hard times. More often, hobos were depicted as public nuisances evicted by the police from their hobo jungles, turned back at the California line for vagrancy. These images left a great deal unsaid about what happens when a man becomes a hobo. They joined a club, you might say, and they took an oath, Brotherhood of Bulls. Hobos had a culture and a code of honor that had been handed down for generations. To begin with, you weren't a bum. Bums begged. Hobos worked. To find work or a meal, you looked for distinctive signs left by other hobos. This sign meant kindly lady. I had a lady say, three guys have been here already. I don't have anything to eat. I've got a loaf of bread is all I got left. I said, well, bread would taste like cake. Could you give me a couple of slices of bread? Well, sure, I'll give you that. And, and that bread tastes so good, it tasted like cake. If you had a hobo's mark on your door, you would be assured of many interesting visitors. Asking to sharpen our knives. And that now a person would think it was very weird if a, per, if a stranger came and wanted all your table knives and, so that they could sharpen them. But not th at that time, it was perfectly customary. Hobos were tolerant of most forms of eccentricity, but certain people were not welcome at the campfires. They were called yeggs, escaped cons and other men who preyed on hobos. In old days, they would, you would hand these people a match and say, build your own fire. That meant you better get out. Hobos knew trains like a lover knows his beloved. They preferred steam locomotives to the diesels that were starting to appear. Steam trains were prized for their beauty as well as their deliberate nature. They took a while to build up steam, so they were easier to hop. Some famous names were once proud to call themselves hobos. Robert Mitchum, Melvin Belli, James Michener. The famous author's final television interview was for this program. He reflected on his days as a hobo. I covered myself with the glory in the hobo camps because I would be one of the youngest, but also one of the bravest. The most difficult of hobo feats was called riding the rods, that is, riding the struts underneath the boxcar. And the cinders are right there. I did it once to prove I could, and then I chickened out completely, never again. But once aboard a rolling box car, they were the innumerable epiphanies of the open road. You have a sequence of epiphanies when things suddenly look clear. What a wonderful experience it is to sleep on top of a mountain. What a wonderful experience it is to lay on sleep on the river and, and look at the sky an hour before you go to sleep and see all the stars and dream about the day that you'd be among those stars. There was a name for a hobo's heaven. It was called the Big Rock Candy Mountain. <laughs> In a big rock candy mountain, all the cops got wooden legs, and a bulldog all got rubber teeth, and a hen's laid soft boiled eggs. All the farmers' trees are full of fruit, 
And the barn's all full of hay Oh, I'm bound to go where there ain't no snow Where the rain don't fall and the wind don't blow And the big rock candy mountain The mythical big rock candy mountain Where you have the lemonade springs And the, you never find it It's always over the next horizon And you just keep going down the road A hobo's road never ends This experience infected a few hobos with permanent wanderlust. They spent their days endlessly looping across the rail lines of the country, following the seasons and the crops, until they diminished and vanished like the steam trains themselves. But for all the other hobos of the 30s, there was the matter of a destination. Chances were that would be where the rails ended at the western shores at the Big Rock Candy Mountain of the West, California. The Great Depression arrived late in California and its impact was muted. There was even a reverse depression in the state. The 1930s saw the coming of age of the California good life. Suburbia, the great outdoors, car culture, imported from Texas, the barbecue, from Hawaii, brightly colored men's shirts, and surfing. Visionaries and eccentrics seemed to congregate at the coast. There was newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst on the right. On the left, any number of socialists, spiritualists, health faddists, and just plain oddballs. Side by side with the free spirits, there were growing numbers of the destitute. Refugees from the Dust Bowl were arriving by the hundreds of thousands. They joined an underclass of people who had lost their jobs, their homes, and their life savings to the Depression. In the sheer numbers of the California poor, there was immense potential power. If someone could capture their vote, he could shake the foundations of the state. By October 1934, it appeared that Upton Sinclair was about to do just that. We have put life into the old donkey, at least so far as California is concerned. And the men and women who supported Sinclair were on the glory road. They were the nobodies. The people would come to California for a second or a third or even a fourth chance. Every schoolboy knew of Sinclair, who authored the 1907 expose of the meatpacking industry, The Jungle. And it created a sensation because everybody had at some point another to eat meat. Uh, and, and it horrified them to think of the conditions under which their meat produced. Fewer people knew of Sinclair, the politician. He had run several times for various offices on the socialist ticket, getting nowhere. There was little about Sinclair that appealed to the mainstream. He was the very model of the California eccentric. He ate only uncooked fruits and vegetables. He was an obsessive sunbather, a teetotaler, whose idea of a binge was gorging himself with ice cream. Yet he cherished the notion of a serious run for public office. And one day in 1933, he stunned the Socialist Party by registering as a Democrat. Soon afterward, he declared his candidacy for governor of California. Supporter Morton Newman was there for the curious announcement. He said in a very offhand way that there was a possibility that he might run for governor and that he might run on the Democratic ticket. And this was the first that anybody had heard of about this. This socialist in democratic clothing had a catchy program. End Poverty in California, or EPIC. EPIC called for government takeover of idle lands and factories, which would provide employment for the poor. Land, industry, and poor people. California had a surplus of all three. EPIC touched a nerve. Rank and file socialists supported him and working people supported him, farmers supported him, people who were 
suffering in 1934 and who saw Upton Sinclair and his program as a reasonable program. It seemed like a common sense program to take resources that were being unused and turn them over to people who needed them. It would have been a crank campaign in any other time and place, but this was 1934 in California. In the primary, Sinclair ran away with the nomination. It shocked the country. With the Democratic Party cresting in popularity, Sinclair was now a front runner. It went right to the candidate's head. We are not going merely to end poverty in California, but we are going to show how the whole people can end poverty in civilization. But in the strongholds of power, in Sacramento and Hollywood, Sinclair was a marked man. The prospect of putting such an unknown figure, such a naive uh, figure in, uh, in uh, political terms, such a visionary utopian figure in the chief executive office in Sacramento, sent fear and terror to the oligarchy of this state. Directly after the primary, the oligarchy struck back. Republicans began looking through Sinclair's books for controversial material, and they didn't have to read too closely. He had, in one book or another, insulted practically every phase of American life. The papers overflowed with cartoons and editorials that demonized the candidate. Newsreels put a new spin on the migration of undesirables into the state. They didn't blame the Depression, they blamed Sinclair. Your inquiring cameraman interviewed 30 stated that they were on their way to California to spend the winter and to remain there permanently if the epic plan went into effect. Hollywood uh, was fearful of, uh, of Sinclair and in fact went so far as to put fake newsreels out with uh, actors posing as Bolsheviks with heavy Europe Eastern European accents saying, well, I'm going to vote for Sinclair. If he had only faced a Republican candidate, he would have won the election. But a Progressive Party candidate was put up against him, and the Republican Party, of course, did not discourage this. Despite all the heavy artillery, Sinclair still had the poor and working class vote. As November approached, it appeared as though he might actually carry the day. Even Sinclair was amazed. One thing he had never counted on was winning. As the days to the final election were approaching, he began worrying about the fact that he might be elected. It all came down, perhaps, to one man's vote. On the afternoon of September 4th, Sinclair arrived at Hyde Park. He had taken a week off from his campaign to journey to the Shrine of the New Order. With FDR's endorsement, he thought, the governor's office was his. FDR made political small talk with Sinclair, characteristically dodging the main issue. But Sinclair came away from the meeting believing he had the president's support. He had miscalculated. Roosevelt had no intention of supporting such a controversial character as Sinclair, even if he was a Democrat. Then FDR made a secret deal with Sinclair's Republican opponent. If he would pledge not to block the New Deal in California, Roosevelt would promise not to endorse Sinclair. He was not willing to sacrifice even a, a marginal amount of political capital in order to take the, the risk of being labeled once again as a radical. On election day, the ever hopeful Sinclair delivered a victory speech for the newsreel cameras. Of course, I appreciate the tremendous compliment which the people of California have paid me in electing me their governor. The speech would not see the light of day. The final tally was 879,000 for Sinclair, 1.1 million for his opponent. California politics got back to normal. Courting big agriculture, heavy industry, and Hollywood. Upton Sinclair got back to his raw vegetables, his sunbathing, and the thing which, after all, he did best, writing books. And the wily old master of the game got back to the real business of his administration, 
putting people to work. FDR knew most Americans would trade all the utopian schemes in the world for a pickaxe and a paycheck. He was about to deliver in historic fashion. By 1935, marathon dancing was fast becoming a thing of the past. Nobody waited around anymore to see the last couple drop. They no longer had the time. FDR's New Deal was putting millions of Americans back to work. It was as primitive as work gets. You may have had a trade or a college degree, but now you went to work with a pick and a shovel, digging ditches for the WPA, clearing trails for the CCC. After years without a regular paycheck, working people were grateful. There was a kind of an elation that uh, took hold of us. My father uh, got his job, and with his first paycheck, we went to an ice cream parlor and had ice cream together. FDR's comment about the CCC was that, yes, these people will, these young people will go to work to do fairly simple tasks. But it isn't just the work they will do. It is the experience of work that will be of moral and spiritual value to them. There was some highly skilled work to be had, most memorably in the arts. American painters were put to work transforming the interiors of public buildings. These frescoes were executed for San Francisco's Coit Tower. Since art is every bit as contentious as politics, opinions differ about these paintings. Some saw them as the most accessible American art of the century. But others saw much that was derivative and even smacking of radical politics. At Coit Tower, one artist did not mind baiting his critics. All the New Deal programs came under attack for worker laziness, shovel leaning. I'm sure some of them were lazy. I'm sure there were abuses. I mean, human nature is such. But no program staffed primarily by lazy workers could have accomplished the incredible work of laying out the trails and clearing the forests and preparing the watersheds that the CCC did or building the massive array of public structures that the WPA did. It doesn't make sense. The accomplishment was too great. The New Deal didn't end the Great Depression. Some of the hardest economic times were still ahead 1937 and 1938, the so-called Roosevelt Recession. But the shadow of despair had been lifted from the land. There's no question that it uh, alleviated, but it didn't cure. Through work relief, uh, WPA, other relief programs, uh, public works, and particularly the farm program alleviated distress on a wide scale, there's no question about that. But the depressive condition of the country continued. Herbert Hoover had once seemed destined for presidential greatness. He had remained the same, but the country had utterly changed. Now on the political sidelines, he had more time to spend fishing with his grandchildren. Hoover's naive political style was one of the casualties of the Depression. There was a new order in Washington, media savvy, opportunistic. Politics at its best, and some say its worst. Some of America's innocence had been lost, but her political genius had been found. 
President Roosevelt had helped to banish the fear of hard times. It remained to be seen how he would lead the nation out of the Great Depression. I've often wondered what would have happened if during the Great Depression, Americans had decided that Hoover was right and FDR was wrong. If we had said, let's just wait this depression out. Americans are tough and individualistic and don't need the government's help. The federal government would have certainly been smaller today and many would say less intrusive. But it's also very possible that American democracy would have died that we would have succumbed to chaos, class warfare, and possibly a violent revolution. Americans made a different choice. They chose FDR four times. Prosperity is just around the corner. Around the same corner with prohibition, I reckon. Why, can't you understand why I'm so cheery? Yes, just like I understand the Einstein theory. But look at all the bumper crops the farmers have to sell. And every time they get a crop, the price goes plumb down. Well, every cloud still has a silver lining. But that don't line the pockets in your pants. 